Go with me to the book of Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 1. The Bible reads, now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Let me read again. Verse 2. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one-fourth of the day. They read the law of their God for one-fourth of the day. And for another fourth of the day, what did they do? They confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. I like it. I like that. I know. And therefore, one fourth of the day, they read the law of God. And for another fourth of the same day, they confessed their sins and worshipped the Lord their God. Verse 4, then Jeshua, Bani, Katniel, Shebaniah, Bani, Sherebiah, Bani, and Shinani stood on the stairs of the Levites and cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. And the Levites, uh, Jeshua, Katniel, Bani, Hashbaniah, Sherebiah, and Hodijah, Shebaniah, and Petahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord, your God, forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made a heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The hosts of heaven worships you. Hallelujah. And you go to the last verse in chapter 9, the book of Nehemiah. The Bible says in verse 38, And because of all this, we make, we make, a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests seal it. Let me read it again. Verse 38. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests seal it. Hallelujah. Now I've just read in the book of Nehemiah chapter 9. Last week we spoke in chapter 8 that Ezra, they built up a wooden platform. And Ezra stood on the platform and he opened the scroll. He opened the book of the law of their God. And the Bible declares that he read. Once he opened the book, for the people could see Ezra because he was standing on a high platform. You know, and the Bible declares they stood up and they said, Amen, Amen. Why? Because they were ready. Their ears of the Spirit were attentive. 
attentive, you know, to the law of their God. And Ezra read the law of the law, their God, as it is. And the Bible declares there were men that were working with Ezra, the priests and the Levites. They assisted the people to understand what Ezra read. To them, and when the Bible declares, when the people understood, you know, the law of the law, that is something that is important. There, a message was conveyed, the law was read to the people, and they were assisted, they were helped to understand stand the law of their God. And that's why they were convicted. In their hearts, they started to cry, they started to weep, you know, and then the Bible says, Nehemiah, he said to them, this is not the day to weep, nor to cry, this day it is holy unto the Lord. You go and drink and eat and share your, I mean, your food with those who are destitute, who have nothing to put on their table. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Bible declares people were excited. Great was the noise of joy evaporating. Hallelujah. Great was the noise of joy that made Jerusalem to vibrate. Hallelujah. It was the noise of joy, of rejoicing. And the Bible declares the people, they went back to their houses. Why? Because they understood. Hallelujah. The weight of the Lord. And the Bible also tells us that as Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Then the next day, as Ezra was reading and searching the holy scriptures in the law of God, there are men that came to Ezra. Now, as they were studying the word, then they came to a point where it says, on the seventh month, it spoke about the feast of the seventh month. It spoke about the feast of the booths, tabernacle. Now, the feast of booths of or tabernacles, it is when on the seventh month, they would dwell in temporary shelters. Those temporary shelters that will be made up of, you know, olive branches, pine, palm branches, you know, and they will collect those branches from the mountain top and they will make temporary shelters. Now, I'm not going to go deeper on this background as I'm recapping. I did allude on this point last week. On our message, I mean, from ruin to revival, but it is important for me to start our today's message from that point where the Bible it tells us that they built these temporary shelters and they will then dwell in those booths or temporary shelters made up of olive branches, palm branches for seven days. Now, why they will dwell? in those temporary shelters, sorry, they will be commemorating and uh, celebrating in the, I mean, in other words, uh, the wilderness journey. Now, when they dwell in those temporary shelters, as they dwell in those booths, then they will then remember the journey in the wilderness, the 40-year journey that was in the wilderness. Their forefathers, then they wandered. Some of them, they died in the wilderness. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Some of them, they came out of Egypt and they they did not cross the river Jordan in order to take over and take charge over their inheritance. Canaan, they died in the wilderness. Why? They never mixed the message, the preaching of Moses with faith. Hallelujah. Now when they dwell in those temporary shelters, that memory will come back to them and say, you know, it will tell them that my forefather, some of them, they did not taste their destiny. Why? Because they never mixed the word of God with faith. 
And then as they are dwelling in those temporary shelters, they will be reminded about the goodness of God, about the exploits and the might works of their God. They will be reminded about how God dried up the Red Sea, how God gave them water from the rock, which is the rock of ages, that Paul in the church in Corinth, he tells them that that rock that accompanied them in the wilderness, that rock that quenched their thirst in the wilderness, it was our Lord Jesus Christ, the rock of ages, the lily of the valley, the prince of peace, the king of kings, the one and the only God, the eternal word of God gave them water in the wilderness when they were thirsty. Now as they dwell in those temporary shelters, they would be reminded about how God led them with the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of cloud of the, the, the pillar of fire by night, guiding them in the wilderness. How God, hallelujah, divinely empowered them to defeat the nations that sought to be a thorn in them pursuing their destiny. How God defeated the nations that sought to hinder and to be obstacles and to sabotage and abort their destiny. Hallelujah. How Moses lifted up his hands whilst on the hill, whilst Joshua, the son of Nun, the Ephraimite, was advancing against the Amalekites. As long as the hands of Moses were lifted up towards heaven, Joshua was advancing against the Amalekites. His physical obedience of worship, hallelujah, it released a divine breakthrough, a divine victory against their enemies. Now as they dwell in those temporary shelters, they will then commemorate these mighty exploits and mighty wonders that indeed we remember that it is our God who sustained, who preserved them. Their feet did not swell. Hallelujah. They did not hunger in the wilderness, but God provided, sustained, and preserved them by the Wait, hallelujah, of his mouth, hallelujah. As the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, that creation, everything that the Lord created, it is held up together by the weight of his power, hallelujah, by the power of his weight, the weight, the weight sustained, the weight preserved them. Now as they dwell in those temporary shelters, then they will begin to feed in the goodness, the past goodness of their God. Hallelujah. As they feed in that past goodness, strength will be released. That's why Nehemiah, he is saying to them, the joy of the Lord is our strength. The feast of the tabernacles, the feast of booths. Hallelujah. It is there to remind them about the goodness of God. It is there to remind them about the, 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 the righteous hand of God that brought salvation to himself that delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now they dwelt in those temporary shelters. Hallelujah. They dwelt in those temporary shelters reminding them feeding on the goodness and the past goodness of their God. As they did that, it released strength. As they did that, it built up their faith. As they did that, it raised up their confidence and their boldness and their resilience. Why? Because if the Lord dried up the Red Sea, if the Lord sustained them in the, in the wilderness, if the Lord led them by the pillar of cloud by day, then the pillar of fire by night, our God, hallelujah, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. He is able. Hallelujah. He has all the sufficient power and authority to do the same in our lives. To preserve us, to sustain us, to guide us, and to fight our battles in the present. Hallelujah. That is our God. 
That's how our God is so faithful. That's why the Bible declares Jesus for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. They spread on his face. They stoned him. He was naked on the cross. They bruised him. But the Bible declares he did not give in. He did not give up. He carried the cross. Hallelujah. And he was able to, start to, 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 to rise above the pain to rise above betrayal by Judas, to rise above, hallelujah, being humiliated and disgraced. Why? Because the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. In other words, which joy that was set before him, he began to see you and I being redeemed from the influence and the power of sin with joy that was set before him. He began Began to see believers the fulfillment of what Joel said that all flesh will be filled by the indwelling spirit of God. He began to see his body, the church, being birthed to propagate the message of the gospel for the joy that was set before him. That goodness that he saw, it released supernatural strength and, and, and power for him to, 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 to endure the humiliation, to endure the stoning, to endure the pain of carrying the cross. That's why the Bible declares, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Why did the Lord allow them, when he dried up the Red Sea, that they must collect 12 stones? You know, from the from where from the sea you remember they walked on dry ground and i believe the type of stones that they were able to take you know as they were crossing on dry ground because the red sea was dried up and the river jordan those are the type of stones that you won't get by the banks you know, I'm just thinking, I'm just adding my own thoughts, I'm just thinking. People have done marine, you know, uh, studies, maybe they know that there are, there are types of stones that you get from the deep. This is where you get them from the deep. And that's why the Lord said, as you cross over, hallelujah, collect these 12 stones. Let them be a monument. Let them be a memorial. For yourselves and your generations when they look at these stones then they begin to be reminded about the goodness about the hand about the love about the mercy about the compassion about the grace of your heavenly father in the river Jordan they did the same thing which means as you look at the stones hallelujah from the river Jordan you begin to see that if our God dried up the Red Sea if my God was able to be a way maker, to make a way where there was no way. When you see that past goodness, it builds up your faith. Hallelujah. It builds up your confidence and your boldness and your trust in your God. You begin to say, I don't believe that he brought me this far only to leave me. You begin to say, hallelujah. If the Lord was able to dry up the river Jordan, the Lord will be able to empower me to go through this giant. To go through this destructive storm in my life. So in other words, you are feeding on the goodness of the Lord. As you feed on the goodness of the Lord, it releases supernatural strength. You speak like Paul and say, rejoice in the Lord. And I say it again, rejoice in the Lord. Even though Paul, he is in prison. He is chained. He is in a cold, I mean, dungeon. Hallelujah. But Paul was able to say, rejoice in the Lord. I might be chained, but but my vision, it is not chained. My destiny is not chained. My purpose is not chained. God's will in my life is not chained. I have the unquenchable passion to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not chained within me. That's what Paul the apostle said. He said these chains of mine are for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Christ while he was feeding on the goodness of the Lord. That's why David, when he speaks, he says, I would have fainted if I did not believe that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I may be going through hell. I may be going through the shadow of doubt, the shadow of hopelessness, the shadow of discouragement, the shadow, hallelujah, of hopelessness. But I will fear no evil. I believe that this season will pass. Why do I believe? I believe in the goodness of the Lord. I shall live. I shall not die. I will believe the report of the Lord. Hallelujah. About my life. Not the report of the devil. Not the report of the enemy. Not the report of limitation and failure. But the report of the Lord. I will believe about my life. They dwelt in temporary shelters, reminding them, feeding on the goodness of the Lord. Hallelujah. And the Bible, it says, on the 24th day, hallelujah, of the same month, the Bible tells us that they read the law of God for one-fourth of the day. That's where we are today. For one-fourth of the day, they read the law of God. They studied the law of God. They searched the holy scriptures with all readiness of heart. With a teachable spirit, they read the law of God. They made the point that this word, it was a mirror to them. You see, when you use a mirror, you look at the mirror for the mirror, mirror rather, to reflect your face, to reflect, hallelujah, yourself. You don't look at the mirror so that it reflects my wife, it reflects my son, it reflects my neighbor, it reflects my colleague, it reflects, you know, other people know. I look at the mirror so that it reflects me. The mirror is able to speak with me that there is a speck in your eye, there is a log in your eye, there is something in your mouth, there is something, you know, maybe even a child, look at the mirror. I mean, we look at the mirror so that we see that there are no snorts. And I'm sorry to use that word. Well, there are no snorts, you know, greeting other people, you know. We, what do we do? We make sure that our nose is fine, everything is fine, because the mirror, it tells us that here, you must do this, you must do that, you must do that, you must do this. So in other words, they searched the scriptures as they were searching the scriptures with a teachable spirit. The scriptures were reflecting the condition of their hearts, own hearts. That is the of the study of the word. You study the word for self-enrichment. You study the word for self-edification. You study the word so that the word that is able to rebuke me, to correct me, to encourage me because all scripture, it is God inspired, God breathed, profitable for what? For reproof, for correction, and for what? For training in righteousness. And therefore, they searched the scriptures and they used the scriptures as their mirror. The scriptures, they were in the, 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 the word was able to reflect their own state. And the Bible declares, for one fourth of the day, they read the Holy Scriptures. And the Bible continues to say, another fourth, one fourth of the day, they began to confess their sins. One fourth, other version they say, the first quarter of the day, they read the, 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 the law, they studied the law of God. Another quarter of the day, that is NIV, what did they do? The Bible declares, they confessed their sins and worshipped the Lord, their God. What a powerful scripture. That is worth our attention and time, hallelujah, to look at. That they studied the word. From studying the word for one-fourth, 
I am reiterating it deliberately so that it gets engrafted in our spirit and in our minds. And for another one fourth of the day, they read so that they confessed their sins and worshipped the Lord. Now, the subject of my message today, it says, Recipe for Revival. Recipe for Revival. There are certain ingredients that must precede Revival. What was taking place here in Jerusalem, the walls were rebuilt. But the Lord now was busy rebuilding, reinstating, and restoring, hallelujah, their spiritual lives. Now, the Bible, it says, they read the law, and for one-fourth, they confessed their sins. Last week, we dealt with the weight, but it starts with the weight. There is no revival without the weight. Son of man, can these bones live? Only you, oh God knows. Hallelujah. You are the all-knowing God. Hallelujah. You know my rising up. You know my thoughts from afar. Where can I flee from your presence? Why? Because only you, oh God. God, no, but is that all? I've given you the word of life, hallelujah. Speak to these bones, hallelujah. Why in the bones they came back to life? Why? Because of the power of the word of the Lord that Isaac released. I don't want us to linger and to dwell there today. And the Bible tells us in the book of 2 Kings chapter 3, there's a story about the son of Ahab. The son of Ahab. His father died. Ahab, he was the king of Israel, husband to Jezebel. Now when he died, the Bible declares the king of Moab rebelled against Ahaz, the son of Ahab. He said, I am not going to pay taxes and tributes, no, I am not going to do that because he thought Ahab is dead, the one I feared, and therefore I'm not going to pay any tax. And then the Bible, it goes on to say, then Ahab, he went to the Edomite king, and then he also spoke with the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. Remember, according to our teaching, it was during the time of the divided kingdom of Israel. And Judah was dwelling in the south, while Israel was in Samaria. Now Ahaz, the son of Ahab, he went to Jehoshaphat and said, this is what the king of Moab is doing. He refuses to pay taxes and tributes because he would pay about a thousand lambs and a wool of a thousand rams to Ahab. Now Jehoshaphat said, you are my relative. Why not? Let's go to battle. And the Edomites, for the first time we see the Edomites partnering with their cousins. Because remember, the Edomites, it's a nation that descends from Esau, the twin brother of Jacob. Now, these three kings, they allied together, and the Bible declares they decided to take the way of the wilderness. They take the wilderness route to Moab. Now, along the way, as they were going to Moab for battle, the Bible declares there was no water. They were dehydrated, including the animals that were following them. They had no water to give those animals. And then Jehoshaphat, he said, because remember, if they were in the wilderness, if they would be found by their enemies once dehydrated, it means they will be weaker and vulnerable to their enemies. Now Jehoshaphat, he, he asked them, don't we have here, don't we have here a prophet of the Lord? You must mark this, not self-appointed prophets, but the prophet of the Lord. And one of the servants answered and said, I know a man who used to pour water in the hands of Elijah. So in other words, this man 
man was so close to Elijah. He served Elijah. When Elijah was taken by the Lord, then the mantle of Elijah was left with this man. He received a double portion. I'm just paraphrasing the scriptures. And the Bible declares, Then Jehoshaphat said, Let's go to the man. And they arrived and found Elisha, the successor of Elijah, and the Bible declares Elisha when he saw the son of Ahab and then he spoke to him and said as long as the Lord lives I was not going to stand before you because of the wickedness and the immorality of your mother and your dad but because of Jehoshaphat I am just summarizing the story and the Bible then it says he called for a harpist and then the man began to play the harp and the Lord spoke and said you go and dig ditches you go and dig holes there's going to be no sign of rain there's going to be no rain that's what Elisha said but water will fill up the ditches water will fill up the holes hallelujah and the bible declares they believed the prophet they went back to their camp they began to dig the ditches i said to you recipe for revival the ingredients that must precede the revival therefore they needed water and the god said through the prophet you must dig the ditches and they begin to they, they began rather to dig the ditches and the bible says the next day water came uh, towards uh, their camp and filled the ditches and filled the holes they had abundant of water to drink uh, for themselves as soldiers and their animals the lord was able to fulfill his prophetic word. They drank from that water. They were nourished. They were refreshed. And the Bible, it also tells us that the same morning as the sun was rising up, the sun was reflecting on the waters. And the Moabites, they were standing from afar. Now when they saw the sun, the reflection of the sun upon the water in the wind. Because we serve a God who makes a highway in the wilderness. We serve a God who opens up streams of water in the wilderness. We serve a God who prepares a table in the wilderness. We serve a God who prepares a table in front of your enemies. You stand resolute, unshaken, and immovable. Why? Because you serve a God who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You serve a God. Hagar, the maid servant of Sarah, she said, you are the Lord that sees. Hallelujah. You were able to see me and my son at the point of being exhausted in the wilderness. At the point of being dehydrated in the wilderness. At the point of giving in and giving up already. She had thrown the towel. She said, let me not see see and look upon Ishmael breathing his last breath but the Lord our God who is able our God that is able was able to provide a well hallelujah for Hagar and Ishmael in the wilderness you are the Lord God that sees he sees your pain. He sees what you go through. A destructive storm. Remain there. Hold on and feed on the past goodness of the Lord. Don't allow the giants. Don't allow the wilderness. Don't allow the storm to erase the feast of the tabernacles. To erase the past goodness of our God. Because our God, he is the same yesterday, today and forever and the Moabites they were amazed they were blown they said to themselves these three kings they have killed one another why because when they looked at the waters because of the sun that was rising up 
that because of the reflection of the sun, they looked at the waters, they thought, they saw the waters, they said, no, there is blood everywhere. They thought what they were seeing is the blood of the soldiers of Israel, of the Edomites, of Judah. They said they have killed one another. Let us go to the other side and collect spoils. I don't know why the Bible it tells us as the sun was rising up hallelujah, upon the waters, the sun of righteousness will rise up with healing in his wings. I don't know why the soldiers of Moab, they thought the water was blood, seeking blood, hallelujah, seeking blood, yet that was the water, hallelujah. They were covered in glory. They were covered. The Lord was pointing us, telling us about something that will take place in the future. Even the enemies, they saw the water. They thought the water is the blood. Hallelujah. And when they arrived in the camp, the Bible declares the soldiers of Israel, they rose up. They began to annihilate, to root them out. And the Bible declares the soldiers of Moab, they were defeated. Defeated, they ran for their lives to a point where the children of Israel they were relentless, hallelujah, in piercing the sword against the Moabites to a point where the king of Moab he took his own son that was supposed to reign after him and offered his own son because he was short-sighted, he was wicked, he was immoral and sacrificed his own son on the wall. And when Israel saw that human sacrifice, the abomination of desolation, the wickedness, then Israel, they turned back to their camp. What am I trying to say today? What am I trying to say to us this morning? The Lord is telling us that the Bible tells us they read the law. They were convicted by the weight. They began to confess their sins. Children of God, there is no revival without the weight. There is no revival without confession of sins. The weight and the confession precedes revival. For one fourth of the day, they read the law. Another one fourth of the same day, they confessed it their sins. And Elisha said to them, you dig the ditches. You go back and dig the ditches. Before water will fill the holes, you must make sure that you have dug the ditches. To dig the ditches by the one. It speaks about what was taking place in Nehemiah chapter 8 and chapter 9. They read the law of the Lord. They were convicted in the their hearts and they began to do what? To confess their sins. That is digging the ditches. When you dig a ditch it is the restoration. It is going back. It is running back to the word of life. To the word of liberty. When you dig the ditches it is the sign of confession that I'm confessing that which the word has convicted me. Hallelujah. The word convicted me. The word reflected my spiritual state. And therefore, I'm confessing to dig the ditches. It is all about repentance. Hallelujah. That is digging the ditches. There is no revival without the recipe. Which recipe? It has ingredients in it. The word confession and repentance from sin. Then revival will come when we go back, when we run back to the word. The word becomes our final authority over our lives and we confess. We confess. Hallelujah. There's no revival without confession. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13 He who covers his sins shall not prosper. But whosoever confesses them shall have mercy. There is no revival. The Bible declares 
There is no revival without confession. In Nehemiah chapter 9, they confessed their sins. Hallelujah. We have seen the condition of my heart. Exactly, you have spoken with me, O oh God. Amen and hallelujah. Not amen only to the gospel of prosperity. You shall be the head, not the tail. You shall borrow from none and lend to many the prosperity that is not preceded by the word of God. I believe in prosperity. I believe in success. But success that is not based and grounded on the principles and the values of God's word. That is the prosperity and the success of the world, it starts with the weight. It starts with confession. They confessed their sins. They did not cover their sins. They did not, you know, emulate Adam and Eve who took fig leaves. They took fig leaves and covered themselves. Adam and Eve, where are you? Adam, where are you? They made artificial, hallelujah. They took leaves to cover their nakedness. And God told them, and God was able to show them the way that you don't use fig leaves. You don't use false fronts. You don't use a mask to cover your sin. You need the blood. And the Lord was able to slaughter an animal to atone for their sins out of the skin of the animal. Our God, the designer, designed their apparel and he clothed their nakedness. You don't need fig leaves, you need the blood. Hallelujah. That's why John, the apostle, when he speaks in the book of 1 John chapter 1, he tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sin, cleanses us, not fig leaves, but the blood of Jesus. But before the blood will cleanse, before the blood will purify, the fact to be confessing, and he goes on to say, if we say we are without sin, we lie, and the truth is not within us, but our God, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. When we confess our sins, hallelujah, when we confess like the tax collector who stood before the Lord, he was even ashamed to look up and say, Lord, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. And what the other one was saying, I pay tithes twice a week, I fast, I pray, yet sin was in his heart, yet dishonesty was in his heart, yet the spirit of the world of greed and corruption was in his heart, and the man just said, Lord, I am here to confess my sins, and the Lord, he did not come to condemn the world, but he came that the world through him might be saved when you confess. He does not judge. When you confess, he, what does he do? He separates your sins. As far as the east is from the west. And that's what the Bible tells us. They confessed their sins. Hallelujah. They spoke exactly what was in their hearts. That's why the Bible tells us in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 13, rend your hearts, not your garments. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Joel was saying the reason why these four types of locusts, they have come and they have eaten the whole harvest and they have also eaten the seeds for the next harvest. New wine is cut off. Joy is cut off. Where in Jerusalem? The reason why Joel was saying that he says now, rend your hearts, not your garments. Now, in the Old Testament, they would rend garments. Rending the garment, it was symbolic of your contriteness and the brokenness of your spirit. Now, Joel is saying, in order for you to see restoration, in order for you to see revival, you must confess your sins. You must rend your hearts, not your garments. Hallelujah. That's why Isaiah, when he speaks, he says, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Hallelujah. In other words, don't rend your garments. Now, as you rend your 
garments. That's what he said in the Old Testament. And show that indeed there is sincerity and genuineness of their heart. As you rend your garment, indeed it must reflect a contrite heart, a broken spirit that responds to the word of God with optimism. That responds to the word of God with a teachable spirit. That's why Isaiah, when he speaks in Isaiah chapter 66, he says, On this man will I look to a man that trembles at my weight. Hallelujah. I will look at this man, a man with a contrite heart, a man with a broken spirit. Hallelujah. Rand your hearts. Rand your hearts, contriteness of heart, brokenness of the spirit. Lord, I come to you as I am. Here is my heart, oh God. I'm confessing this sin of fornication. I'm confessing this sin of adultery. I am confessing this sin of unforgiveness. I am confessing this sin of slander and gossip. I am confessing this sin. Hallelujah of evil thoughts. Hallelujah of hatred. I am confessing this sin of racism that is in my heart. Lord, I'm confessing it unto thee. God is saying, Come, let us reason together. Even though your sins they are red as scarlet. What am I going to do through my blood? Hallelujah. The blood that was shed on the cross of my son. I will sanctify you. I will purify you. I will cleanse you. You will be whiter as snow. Bazalwani, revival will take place in our lives. When we say, Father, I don't want to be an old wine skin. God cannot pour new wine. Cannot pour his spirit. Cannot pour the end time revival spirit in us if we are old wine skins if you pour new wine in an old wine skin the old wine skin will burst hallelujah so what is it lord renew me because even old wine skins will be renewed when they are old there was a process to restore an old wine skin hallelujah saturating it in water saturating it in oil and leave oil hallelujah making sure that you work with the old wine skin in the potter's house lord reshape me lord rim 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 Mold me rather, oh God, restore the joy of salvation. You are my potter, I am clay in your hands. I am running to the potter's house. I am responding to the call of Jeremiah. Enter the potter's house. Why? I want to be a new wine skin. Why? I want to be a ditch that will hold the water, that will hold the spirit of the Lord, the anointing and the grace for end time revival. It starts with confession. They confessed their sins for one fourth of the day. I am not just going to allow this word to speak to me. I am not only going to allow this word to convict me like Felix who said to Paul after he was convicted, he did not want to repent. He said to Paul, I will call for you again. There's a difference when you talk about repentance there's a difference between remorse and regret and then it just ends there. Hallelujah. The Bible declares you confess your sin and you forsake your sin. That is the repentance now. You don't just confess. You don't just admit that, you know what? There is this in my heart, oh God. But you repent. There are a lot of people who imitate David and say, God forgave David. He will also forgive you. Listen, God forgave David, but David... He suffered the repercussions of his adultery. He became a murderer. Absalom killed the son of David, Amnon. And Amnon raped Tamar, the daughter of David. And hence he was killed by Absalom. 
David lost the respect and honor from Joab, the commander of Israel, because it was Joab that read the letter that you must take Uriah and sabotage him and put him in the hottest side of the battle where he's most likely to be killed. And Joab saw that, and that's why Joab later he would kill Abner, you know, and, and no, no, I mean, defying the, 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 the authority of David. Sometimes he would say, If you don't come here, David, I will name these cities that. I have defeated after my own name. Why? Why? It is because David, let me tell you something, my friend. God forgave him, but he suffered until he went down to the grave. The implications of his sin, the child that was born by Bathsheba out of adultery with David did not survive a week. Are you with me here? I am here to tell you, never ever, the Bible tells us everything that was written in the Bible. It was written for our edification, for our admonishing, for us to be warned so that we don't replicate their immorality, their mistakes, their sin, so that we emulate, hallelujah, their faith, their sincerity of heart towards God. The Bible tells us they confessed their sins. I am here to tell you, I can... You can speak in tongues and say, you know, speak in tongues and I pay my tithe. But let me tell you something. Where there's an unconfessed sin, there's no breakthrough. Where there's an unconfessed sin, the kingdom of God cannot flow through your spirit. Why? Because your spirit, there's a blockage in your spirit. You can't be the channel of God's purpose, of God's destiny, of God's will, of God's divine resources on earth. Why? Because the spirit is contaminated. And that's why it starts with confession and forsaking you forsake your sin. The Bible declares the wages of sin is death. Whosoever commits sin is a slave of sin. The Bible tells us that your sin will surely find you. The enemy can allow you to make your way up the corporate ladder with the elbow, to make your way up through, I mean, spiritual, I mean, positions and positions in the church. You make it to the top, but the enemy knows as long as there's an unconfessed sin in your heart, you can speak in tongues. There's an unconfessed sin in your heart. You can claim to be, I mean, spirit-filled under the fire of the Holy Ghost, but the enemy knows as long as there's an unconfessed sin in your heart, there's no breakthrough. There's no breakthrough. You can't be effective. You can't be fruitful. You can't enjoy the intimate relationship that you ought to have with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as the, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us that if you destroy this body, I will destroy you. What? What are you saying, Lord? The Bible tells us that there is a sin here. When you commit it, you are sinning against your own body. When you commit sexual immorality, in that context, it tells us about sex before marriage. Hallelujah. You commit that, that immorality. You are sinning against your own body. And Paul, he reminds them that, remember, you were bought at a high price. Hallelujah. He was redeemed for your we, 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 he was bruised rather for our transgressions he was pierced because of our sins he cried on the cross and the tatalas tie the price has been paid in full we see revival taking place in Jerusalem why because they are saying Lord your word has spoken with me with me away with you bitterness away with you anger away with you fornication, away with you adultery and trickery, away with you pleasures of this world. They were confessing their sins. They were running back to their God and that's what God wants a recipe for revival. Hallelujah. Confession of sins. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, Hallelujah. You don't just confess, you repent. 
Hallelujah. You don't just confess. You repent. The Bible tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. It tells us that there's a godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. It's beyond regret and remorse. It includes actions. Godly sorrow. It includes actions. I regret. I'm remorseful. I'm sorry of this sin, of this wickedness. Therefore, it includes, you don't only confess it, but what do you do? You act. What type of an action do you do if you go to the Greek text where it tells us about the word repentance? The Greek text, it tells us about M-E-T-A-N-O-I. A meta no ya. Now meta no ya. It is the Greek word about re, of repentance, which means when you say meta no ya, change of mind, change of heart. That is repentance. After thought, there's correction. There's a change of heart. There's a change of mind. I am no longer, hallelujah, living in that old things have passed away. I am a new creation. I am a brand new person. Hallelujah. I am the redeemed of the Lord. I am the righteousness of the Lord. Why? Because I have confessed and I've made a point that I forsake. I forsake from point A. You are in the Eastern Cape. You are going to free state as you are in the Eastern Cape, there's what we call Alwa North. The bridge takes you to Free State from the Eastern Cape. Now, when you confess and when you repent, what do you do? Once you cross over to Free State, you break the bridge. Don't literally do that. It's an example. Don't go and break the bridge, please, 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 please. Don't do that. I'm just making an example here. Then you break the bridge. You destroy the bridge. So that even when the enemy reminds you about your past life, meta, no ya, there's a transformation of the mind that has taken place. I have sunk my mind on things above, not on earthly things. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It is with the mind we serve the law of God, meta, no, yeah, there's a transformation of the heart. There's a change of the heart. The heart of stone has been taken away. The stone has been rolled away. Hallelujah. I have the heart of flesh. A heart that loves God. A heart that yearns and thirsts for righteousness in order to be filled by God. Meta, no, yeah, that's repentance. Come and confess. You confess today, the next day you do the same immorality. You confess tomorrow, you go back and do the same immorality. That is a repentance. That repentance, it has no fruits. Hallelujah. You are just, you regret, you are remorseful, maybe. Ubatiwe. Someone saw you doing this, therefore you just you are just remorseful, you just, you just regret, but there is no action. That's why John the Baptist, he said, go and bear fruits worthy of repentance. So in other words, if you claim to walk in the light, reflect the life of the light. If you claim to walk in the kingdom of God, reflect the love, the mercy, the grace, the compassion, the life of the Father. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. What are you trying to say? Mfundisi. In other words, the Lord is saying, I want to feel you. That's what Joel said. In the last days, he was able to see a hundred years ahead that all flesh, I will fill all flesh with my spirit. Your maid servants, your servants, your sons and daughters, they shall see visions. But before I feel, there's got to be repentance. And before I feel, there's got to be fruits worthy of repentance. 
before I feel you. There's got to be reinstatement, restoration, running back to the weight of the Lord, making the word of God the final authority over your life before I feel you. Hallelujah. And that's what Joel said. Joel said, Hallelujah. When I am weak, that is Joel. That's what Joel said. I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. Why? Because he said, Rend your hearts. Let there be brokenness of the spirit and the contriteness of heart. Then I will feel you. I will feel your heart. When your heart is pure, when I'm the one who purifies it, I'm the one who cleanses it, I have the blood, I have the weight, I have my spirit, but you must just acknowledge and confess it to the Lord. And the Lord will sanctify, will purify, and the Lord will not condemn you. Church, this is not the message of condemnation. This is not the message of judgment. This is the message about the heart of God that says when you run back to the weight, when you allow the way to convict your heart, when you confess your sin and forsake, I will fill you with glory. I will fill you with divine resources. I will fill you with my love. I will fill you with my purpose. I will become a vessel of honor that is useful for every good work in the house of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We appreciate you. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Father, for your loving kindness. You don't change. You don't fail. You remain the same. Lord, purify sanctify, cleanse us, O oh God, as the nation. They stood, O oh God, and confessed the sins of their forefathers. Here we are, O oh God. We say, Moetway, purify our hearts, sanctify our minds through the blood of Jesus Christ. Make us vessels of honor. Make us, O oh God, a sanctuary, Lord, for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We bless your name and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Hallelujah. Paul, when he speaks, he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 18, If I rebuild that which I destroyed, I become a transgressor. Hallelujah. Let us stand in the liberty that Christ has given us. As they confessed, revelation began to come upon them. In verse 5, they spoke about the creation of the heavens and the earth. They spoke about how God created the angels, that the angels were created by God. God spoke the way. You get that here in Nehemiah chapter 9, that the creation of the angels precedes, hallelujah, the creation of the earth and the heavens, because God created the heavens of heavens and the hosts thereof. But when the Lord established the earth, according to Job chapter 38, the angels, they shouted for joy, and these men of God, they stood and they spoke, hallelujah, about the wilderness journey of their fathers, how God sustained, how God preserved, how God even sustained their clothes, and their their sandals for 40 years at the end of the chapter the Levites the priests the leaders they sealed the sure covenant of their God that we are going back to the covenant relationship with our God hallelujah we shall honor you we shall serve you with the loyalty with the pure hearts with the clean hearts and that's exactly what happened and when we do that we are in our rightful position to be the channel of revival. I'm not just praying for revival. Make me, Lord, a revival. Let me, oh God, be a revival. Why? I am a sanctified vessel. Why? I have confessed my sins and forsook them. Why? I have allowed the way to convict me and to guide me. I have embraced thy weight. Thank you, Lord. And we bless you, Father. And we thank you. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he was bruised, he was wounded, he was pierced. He did not come to condemn, but he came so that the world through him might be saved. The Bible declares, cursed is a man 
who hangs on a pole. Jesus, he was hung on a tree. Hallelujah. He became a cast offering to break curses over our lives. Jesus foreknew no sin, but he was made to be seen so that we might become, we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Yes, he was tempted in every area, yet found without sin. He is the Lamb of God without blemish, the sinless Lamb of God that cried on the cross and said, it is finished. The price has been paid in full. He redeemed us, purchased us by his precious blood. You can believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead and you shall be saved. You shall become the child of God and become the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. Please pray after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for the precious gift of eternal life. I am the child of God. I am no longer a sinner. If you just pray that prayer, you are the child of God. Your sins are forgiven. Yes, your name is written in the book of life. You will make it. You have the precious gift of eternal life. Please write to us so that we can walk this spiritual journey with you, so that we can capacitate you and edify, edify your spiritual life, you know, with the resources that we have that will enrich you spiritually. Church, may the Lord richly bless you. Thank you for spending time with me as I was going through this word. I believe that before revival takes place, there's a recipe for revival. There are ingredients that precede revival, the weight, confession of sins, and repentance that bears fruits. May the Lord richly bless you. Continue being the beacon of light and the beacon of hope in our society. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord be gracious on you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine on you. May the Lord give you his peace. May he enlarge your territory. May he keep you from evil. May he bless you. Indeed, recipe for revival. Let us embrace the weight of life and the weight of truth. God bless you.